So now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Tamar Sigler, who will be talking about relative rank and regularity. So it'll be 30 minutes since, since the time that I managed to put this thing on, <laughs> which is not clear how long that's going to take. Sorry. Yeah, success. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, so thank you very much for the organizing for for the organizer for uh, in organizers <laughs> for uh, inviting me, uh, and it's really great pleasure to come here for Andrew's birthday. Um, so I met Andrew uh, many years ago. My, for me, it seems many years ago in two thousand six. I came for <laughs> maybe for everybody. Some people weren't born. Uh, uh, <laughs> So I came, uh, I came for, I was a postdoc at the IAS, and I came for a, a visit here, for a conference here in Montreal. And, uh, and I gave a talk, and uh, after the talk, uh, Andrew comes up to me and he introduces himself and he gives me this uh, folded page and he says, I read this later. So of course I immediately go and, <laughs> and read it. And, uh, and on it, it's like a very densely written, um, lots of things about Montreal and, uh, uh, school system, Jewish community, and lots of stuff like that. And at the very last paragraph, there is like a pseudo offer for to come uh, uh, for tender track. Uh, well, not 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 a formal offer, but but uh, okay. I wanted to go back to Israel, but it was really nice uh, to get this, especially with uh, my much less confident version of, uh, of uh, 2006. Uh, anyway, so um, after a few years, uh, I was back in Israel and Andrew came to visit me with his son, Sebastian, and it was really great. And here, if I manage to make this work, obviously not. It's one of these errors supposed to work. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is Andrew in, uh, in Haifa, and you should all come and visit because it's a very nice view. And, uh, but here's like a maybe more representative picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so we had a yeah. Anyway, we had a, a great time, and uh, uh, now I'll start. Uh, okay, so um, so uh, the slides will be in Hebrew, and uh, the talk will be in English. <laughs> so, <a> tribute for <laughs> Emmanuel. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> I'm just uh, kidding. Uh, okay, <laughs> so. Uh, anyway, it's actually really uh, this theorem. <laughs> so, um, anyway. Um, so let me start with a. Uh, okay, I'm okay. As to hear, no, in Hebrew, I can speak in Hebrew and talk in English or any version that you choose. Uh, yeah, I realize this is quite small, so I can. It's lucky that it's written big over there, and I can see it well. Uh, anyway, so let me start with a um, kind of motivation with a theorem, really beautiful theorem of Schmidt in 1985, from 1985. Uh, so. Okay, it's weird. I have to find out what to look at that I can see. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll look that way. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, so given given d d will be degree and l is the number of polynomials, um, then there is a constant c that depends on d and l such that the following holds. Um, if you give me a collection of l polynomials, um, fa family of homogeneous polynomials of odd degrees. Um, all of odd degrees smaller or equal than D in S, which is greater than C number of variables. So C, C is the lower bound for the number of variables for this to hold. Then, um, then you have lots of integer points. Then the number of integer points um, uh, satisfying PIX is equal to zero for all X with uh, <clears throat> L infinity norm smaller than T is greater than uh, some constant depending on the family of polynomials uh, um, uh, times t to the s minus c. And um, to prove uh, to prove this theorem, um, Schmidt introduced uh, uh, this notion that uh, it's called Schmidt rank, and some people call it h invariant, and some other people call it uh, strength. Um, so let me define it for you. So. Uh, uh, so what is to give it a poly, given a polynomial p um, should have had s variables doesn't matter uh, given a polynomial p then you can um, denote the rank or the Schmidt rank h invariant strength of the polynomial will be the minimal r such that you can find polynomials ti and si of degrees smaller than d and 
P is represented as a sum of SI times TI. So, um, so this is this is the rank. I'll give maybe quick examples soon. Um, but um, okay, so I said that the first person I think, as far as I can tell, as far as I found to define this was Schmidt in his 1985 paper. He introduced it. I'll explain soon why, in order to count points on homogeneous varieties. Um, but um, a different version of it was introduced by uh, Green and Tao. They introduced a different notion, but it was shown to be equivalent, at least when the characteristic is greater than the degree in over finite fields, um, by Baumick and Lovett. In, so way before, maybe 2011, but I think the paper was published 2015. And um, they introduced it when they were studying the inverse theorem for the Gower's norms over finite fields um, for polynomials of bounded degree. But uh, uh, I don't know if they knew, maybe Terry can say later, if they knew about this result of Schmidt and this definition of Schmidt. Um, in any case, it was reintroduced again. Um, by uh, two people from commutative algebra, Ananyan and Hochstel in 2016, and in the proof of a very famous conjecture in commutative algebra called Stillman's conjecture, which studies the complexity of ideals generated by polynomials of bounded degree. So it's a question about the length of the resolution. Um, so I'm, um, I, for a long time, I called it, you know, I didn't know about this paper of Schmidt. I found out about it in, in MSRI five years ago or something like that, seven, I don't remember how many years ago. Um, but, um, but I'm, um, I'm kind of uh, getting towards uh, uh, you adopting this strength definition uh, because rank is something that is used for so many things. And strength is like a, so I'm, uh, I'm gonna try. So from now on, all the slides will have either Schmidt rank or, or strength or H invariant, but they all mean the same thing for me. I'm trying to move towards strength now. So that's, uh, that's, that's what I'm, I'm gonna try at least. Uh, okay, so, so let me, so for our, for our uh, uh, okay, let me give you like a uh, quick example. So, so quick, first of all, uh, here's the definition again. So it's the shortest way you can write a polynomial as a sum of products of polynomials of lower degree. And um, and okay, so it makes sense if the degree is greater than two is greater than one. For degree one, we declare linear polynomials to be infinite strength. And um, so, if the rank of a polynomial one is one, just means that it's decomposable. And um, if the rank is two, then it's roughly like the rank of the quadratic form that de that defines it. So this is maybe why the term rank made sense, but I'll try to say strength. Uh, but here's kind of another thing that will turn out to be important is that it depends on the field. So if you take a field extension, it can drop. Um, okay. Uh, but for this talk, it will be actually important for us not only to talk about a rank of one polynomial, but actually to talk about a rank, about the strength strength of a family of polynomials, I'm really trying, of a family of polynomials uh, of degree D. So, so in his paper, Schmidt defines the rank of a family of polynomials to be, so if they're all of the same degree, so rank depends on degree. If I add to a polynomial of degree, a, a polynomial of lower degree, then I just increase the rank by one, maybe, depending on which definition you use. But, uh, but if you have a family, then, um, then uh, if they're all, if you look at all the polynomials of the same degree, then you take the vector space span by that, and you take the the, the strength of the minimal element that is not non-zero. And if you have varying degrees, you take the minimum over the degrees. Okay. So this this was the definition for a family of polynomials. And uh, so here's uh, here's Schmidt's Schmidt's theorem again. So uh, this counting counting integer points on a uh, for a family of homogeneous polynomials. And, and the key input is, is the following theorem in that paper. So if you denote by R the sum of the degrees of the polynomial, then you, there's a constant depending on D such that if the strength of the polynomial is greater than, carefully look here, so L times R, so something, some number that depends on the number of polynomials. I stress this because it's gonna be important later. And, uh, and if you know that you have many real points, 
then uh, then you have a, a local to global principle. So you can actually so you can actually asymptotically count the number of solutions and mu there is positive. It is the product of local densities. So if you have high rank then or high high Schmidt rank or high strength, then then you can count um, you can very well count number of of integer, in, integer solutions. Okay. So so let me tell you some other great stuff that polynomials that families of, of high rank polynomials satisfy. So I already said, so Schmidt, oh, the year there is wrong. So the year is, I think it's wrong. Uh, I think it's 85. Uh, so, so Schmidt already mentioned that's, that's this uh, uh, for counting integer solutions. Um, what, did, uh, uh, what did Greentown need or show? And, and later their results were made quantitative by, uh, with good quantitative bounds, re very quite recently by Milicevic and Jazzer. Um, is uh, joint equidistribution. So if you want to do higher order Fourier analysis, then you very quickly get into the problem that um, polynomials are not orthogonal. So linear polynomials are, or exponential polynomials are orthogonal and everything is great. And the theory is very, everything is very, e well, relatively easy. Um, but the minute you go up, if you take two quadratic forms, then normally they're not orthogonal. The, the, the problem comes with the rank of the difference. So, um, so you can't come out, and there are also too many of them. You can't hope for them to be completely, completely independent. So the rank kind of plays a role in that. It sort of it brings you this, this, if you have a collection that is, that is uh, uh, that is very strong or high rank, then then they then it satisfies properties of joint equidistribution. So you can almost treat them as they're as orthogonal as you need usually for applications. Um, and then there is an onion of Hochstel that um, why did they define this notion of strength? So they show that if you have a strong family of polynomials, then it satisfies various algebraic independence properties. So in general, they form what is called a regular sequence. And, uh, and Kashidan and I discovered uh, a few years ago that um, there's another very nice property that high rank polynomial uh, satisfy. We could prove it over finite fields and over the complex numbers or generally maybe some other fields. Um, and it's universality. So let me tell you what universality is. Um, what is it? So you give me some any collection of polynomials of your choice, Q1 through QM. Um, and Q1 through QL and M variables and all of degrees smaller or equal than D, then, um, and if you give me a, another collection of polynomials that is of sufficiently high rank or sufficiently strong, and that the, 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 the sufficiently large depends on D, M, and L, but actually in a good way, not, not so good in D, but in a good way on M and L, then you can find a linear map such that um, or such that composed with, with your collection of high rank polynomials P, it gives you this, this collection Q. So basically you can see, see high, you can see any variety you want as a section of a, of a high rank variety. Um, and this is a really useful property. And um, it was, we managed to extend it uh, with my student, Michael Lampert this year, um, to this property of universality for number fields. And it has this uh, nice application. First of all, gives some stability in, in going into algebraic, uh, into algebraic extension. So not with polynomial bounds, not, not, but, but still, still you, the, the bounds, the, the, um, the strength doesn't drop too much going to the algebraic closure. And it also, and, and, and from that one can deduce that actually the, sh the Schmidt rank or the strength or the H invariant is, is essentially the same as the, the Birch rank, which is what many, um, there's one direction that is very easy. It's very easy to show that if you have high Birch rank then you have high Schmidt rank, but in the other direction, um, it's not, I don't know any other way except for this one, but actually be interested in you seeing the NY. Anyway. But I want to go on. Um, so what's your problem? Well, uh, the problem is that uh, you want maybe some stuff to hold for any collection of polynomials and not, unfortunately not, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, uh, uh, not every collection of polynomials is of high strength. 
Um, so what do you do? Well, this is what Schmidt did and what Green and Tao did and what Ananian and Hochstil did. So they all did this, the same, the same thing. Um, you regularize your collection. So you start out with this collection P1 through PL and you don't, you know, they don't behave very well and you can't do anything with them. You can't count, you're, you're not happy. So, um, but there exists another collection of polynomials, usually much larger, Q1 through QL, such that this collection is strong and, um, and your, collect, your original collection is contained in either the ideal or the algebra generated by Schmidt needed ideal and Green and Tao and Anyan needed algebra um, generated by your collection of polynomials. Um, so how do you do it? It's very simple. So let me explain it. I hope, I don't know how much not following the time. So I have no feel for half an hour. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll see. Um, okay, so, uh, so how does this thing work? Um, let me show you how it gets complicated even if you have just start with one polynomial. So you start with one polynomial and it's not of, uh, sadly not of, not strong, not a pi rank. And uh, if it's strong, then you're done. Um, so you fix some strength that you need for your application. Um, remember, strong polynomials have lots of great properties. So, so there is some property for your property to hold. You need the rank to be sufficiently high, some starting point. And um, if it's not, then you, decomp you write your function, your polynomial as a sum of, of these the products of polynomials of lower degree. And you can already see this very appealing because poly, you, you, you can see an inductive process kind of kicking in because other polynomials are of lower degree. So you can replace your singleton P with this collection of uh, 2R or R, depending if you're looking at ideal or, or, or algebra, 2R polynomials, and, uh, and then you continue. So now you have 2R polynomials, but for good things, okay. So, so you proceed. So you can you continue. And how do you know that you ever stop? It's because linear polynomials are an infinite strength. So, at some point, maybe maybe this procedure goes on and on and on. And at the very end, you have just linear polynomials. But then you're very happy. So, uh, so what's the problem um, faced by all by 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 everybody trying to use this procedure? Is that this L is for any application, this L is going to be huge in terms of little L. Because if you remember what I pointed out in Schmidt's result is that you need the rank, like you need the strength to be greater than something that has to do with the number of polynomials. But each time your number of polynomials is much bigger than it was before. So this blows up very quickly. And there is some, Trevor Woolley worked this out, like it's worse than tower bounds. It's really bad. Okay, it grows really quickly, even, even with the best. So here's what I said here, even with the best bound, conjectural bounds, which we don't have yet, um, it grows too quickly. Uh, so, uh, so that's sad. Um, so you go home <laughs> and cry. Uh, <laughs> no. Anyway, so, so what, what, what did we do? So what was the idea? So we were kind of faced with this problem that there's this regularity procedure we really many times want a collection that is roughly independent or roughly orthogonal, but to get to such a collection, uh, we need to pay a huge price in the number of polynomials um, we get from the procedure. So we want to define a more refined notion of strength. So for one polynomial, it's going to be the same, but the problem, you see even the procedure, even in one polynomial automatically gives you 2R. Or like automatically you get many more. So, so we're looking for a procedure that um, um, will work well for, for, for a, a define, define a more refined notion that will work well for families of polynomials. Um, and the, all the great properties that I wrote before will still hold, um, but we'll have an efficient process of regularization. That's, that's the idea. And, and for this, we define this notion of relative rank, but now I'm gonna call it maybe relative strength from now on. And uh, here's, here's like a very simple thing you can do for any set. So if you have a set X, you can define the relative strength with respect to the set X of a polynomial P. So instead of demand, in, so you look at the, polyno the polynomial P, you can do it for any function. Or, okay, anyway, you look at the polynomial P, you restrict it to the set X and you ask what is the shortest what is the shortest uh, uh, representation restricted to your set X? Okay, it's very, very naive. X was the entire 
uh, vector space, then, then no problem. Then it's just the definition that I had before. Um, and in particular, you can, if you're given a collection of polynomials P1 through PL, then you can choose this X to be the variety cut out by these polynomials. So this is XP bar. So this is, this is the, this variety. And, um, and then you can define uh, your, you have a new polynomial or a new collection of polynomials P, and you can you define the rank of the new collection given restricted to the variety cut out by the previous collection of polynomials. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, and you can do this for, for two families of polynomials, but you can do it for any collection of filtered, filtered collection of polynomials. Each time you define it restricted to the variety cut out by, the, by the, all the polynomials defined previously. Okay. Um, so it's very simple. Um, but uh, uh, so this is what we wanted. And, uh, and the great thing is that we can actually, um, we can actually show that this definition uh, works really well. So this is um, one theorem for theorem one. So this is joint with Amichai um, Lampelt. is that if you start with a finite field or you can use model theory to get this for a complex field. So um, field. <laughs> so if you start, so if you start with K finite field, um, then we call this notion relative strength. So, so high relative strength, because this is not a rigorous one. I'll show you one rigorous statement in the next slide, but, but this is the philosophy is high relative strength collection of polynomials have the great properties that I mentioned before. So they have joint equidistribution, they have algebraic independence, and they satisfy this universality property that I had before. So this is the one thing, but here is the important thing okay, that we had that before too. So that, that's not really great. But, uh, but, um, but if you give me a collection of L polynomials, then I can find a filtered collection of polynomials Q of size L. Okay, that's not saying anything new. Um, that first of all, this collection is of high relative rank. Okay, so as I said, each one is, is a relative rank res with respect to the previous variety cut out by the polynomials before. And, um, and your polynomials are contained in the ideal generated by, um, by this new collection. And, uh, and now L is polynomial in the number of, 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 uh, of polynomial you started out with. Um, okay, so this is, uh, uh, I should be done soon or? Okay, so I'm going fast, <laughs> faster than, uh, good. So, um, so here is like, a, here is a, a special case. I just want to show you one rigorous statement. So I'm not, I can't, the definitions are, it's too um, uh, detailed to, to try to give a, a full definition. So let me give you kind of a special case in the case of finite fields. I think of it as, uh, as, as additive combinatoric special case. So you start with, a, with X, which is a collection of polynomials P1 through PL as before, and all the degrees are bounded by D. And you fix some level of equidistribution that you're interested. So this is T. And uh, then you can find a collection of polynomials, Q1 through QL, um, such that if you look at all the, all the level sets of this collection, so YA is where QI is equal to AI. So you, you look at all these level sets, then they're very well equity. So all, all of them share the number of points or up, up to your... Uh, they have the same number of points up to your, uh, uh, yeah, I'm missing something. Uh, it should be, uh, uh, it should be S minus T. <laughs> Sorry, it should be, uh, it's not normalized. It should be, it should be, uh, I'm used to think, I, I, my, I forgot to normalize it. So it should be Q, not the Q to the minus T, that would be uh, uh, unimaginable, but, uh, <laughs> but it should be Q of S minus T. So you, Q of, one over Q to the T, that's the level of equidistribution you want. And this is what you can get. Um, but, uh, but L, this L that you have is polynomial both in this level of equidistribution that you, you want, which is T, and in the number of polynomials L, okay? Um, okay, but, but really what, the way you should think of it is that any problem in additive combinatorics, many times you have some problem and um, you're not really sad if you, 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 you're feel, you, you feel fine if you, or you don't lose too much if you pass to some subset, which is of, um, of size that is not 
um, too small with respect to, start, to the size you started out with. For example, if it's polynomial and the size you started out with, you're, you're, you're kind of happy. So essentially this tells you that this is just a specific example. You can do much more than just count the points. You can count anything you want in these, <laughs> maybe not, but I'm looking in FQ to the S. Yeah, I'm further, yeah, so you think of it kind of, you can, yeah, I'm further, so I didn't write, why, why zero, why zero is contained in X? It's not, this, the QIs are different than, than the PIs, they're not the same at all. So think of the, that you have uh, e, X, it, yeah, X is anywhere, it's not an, yeah, Y zero is contained in X. So the, the, that I forgot to mention that. <laughs> it's important. Uh, so, so your your x contains y zero, which is the zero locus of these new polynomials, and it's this. You can think it's a sub variety of of bounded codimension, and the codimension is bounded by some number that you have good control over. And for most applications, that's sufficiently good for you. And um, um, and in the sub variety, you can do anything you want. Any problem that you want, you can solve. Like these. These uh, this uh, high rank collections of polynomials, you should think of them as like pseudo random. They're they're as orthogonal as you want. Like they would do anything you want from them. They're really friendly. So um, yeah. So uh, uh, so this is like a sample of what they can do. Um, I just say that that he, what what we want to push this forward. So this is clear. What we want to do is that we want to use this to get effective bounds for this Schmidt result that I told you at the beginning. So the Schmidt result has no effective bound on the number of, of, of variables depending on the, on the well, it, you can, I told you to Trevor work this out, but, um, but um, we're actually, we're, we're, we're close. So we're just missing this universal, this, this, uh, this, this result that I mentioned, and we managed to prove now for regular strength that you can, that it stays stable under, under extension. So we need to show that it works for, uh, for uh, for relative rank as well, um, so you can get effective bounds on Schmidt's problem, many other problems, any problem that deals with a general collection of polynomials, you can do that. And also, okay, we're really hoping that we can push these things to maybe get quantitative bounds for Stillman's conjecture, but that's uh, more iffy at the moment. So, but yeah. Anyway, I'll stop here. I think, right? I should stop. Because I had like a, I'm sure I was sure this was that kind of reserve thing, but this is a oh, you can't see you see do you see that sixty? Do you see the zero next to the? So you can't you can't see this, but I found this town in in France called Granville, and I went Google Google went there, <laughs> and on the way there was a Granville six. So uh, anyway, I'll stop here. Yeah okay. Yeah okay. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that you can find a sub variety. Okay, you can find a sub variety of bounded codimension. Okay, bounded, well bounded in this this terms, and for this bound, it's a, for this bounded sub variety. And actually, it's it, you can do anything you want. You can count anything you're interested in. It satisfies all all the excellent properties that that you wanted before. Okay, so I can't do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so all the all this thing. So when you talk about this, of course, if, when you talk about this, these results, they they're not they they mean nothing for very few variables. If you ask me something about curves, this says nothing about that. But obviously, you need many variables to get if you want a, a, a high rank quadratic form, then you need the rank to be, you need at least maybe twice as many variables or something like that. So, um, so clearly this, this is only true for that. And so on the one hand, you lose the hat, right? Because if you want to some understand curves, then you don't get anything from this. But, but on the other hand, this is very general. It works for any family of polynomials that you want. It's not works almost true. It's not an almost true, like any family you want. I can run this procedure and, and, and obtain what I want. It's not, yeah, this T, this T from the beginning? No, no. Oh, there is a T. No, T is your, T is gonna be, it should be Q to the S minus T, no, right? Still, you, you're saying that the- No, L is gonna be polynomial in T. That would make S minus- You get my point. What is L? Is ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry, that's, yeah. That's my question. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Anyway, you choose, yeah, you choose any any level of equidistance. So I, I, if I normalize this correctly, everything would have been 
fine. I should have normalized the, okay, the it's, statement. It seems to me that the question becomes. Yeah, well. yeah, that's one of the and difficulties then, in higher. Yeah, okay, you cover X with two with. Yeah, you can. Sorts of sets. You can cover it with a with a. Thinking, okay, so you can cover obviously you can cover X with its intersection with the various um, with the various uh, uh, level sets of this Y, but yeah, I'm not sure I want I, I I'm not sure I, I I know how to answer that. If you want to overlapping intersections of these guys, possibly probably yes. Um, no, but I guess if if I want to understand X and I understand it's a very complicated variety and I, and your, yeah. your your game is I'm going to break it down to something easier. Yeah, um, it's it's a valid question. No, no, I, I was yeah, um, I was going to think about that and and going to think about that this week because I thought I thought that this is probably a valid question for me for for the first applications we're looking at, which is like the Schmidt result and whatever, is that you don't need that. So so uh, so I haven't worked this. I haven't thought about this yet. But um, but it's a good question. I I, I, I yeah. My my guess is yes, but uh, yeah, but there's no uniqueness here. That's kind of uh, that's the whole problem with uh, with higher order Fourier analysis is that there's no uniqueness. So this is this is the main issue, and this this these collections of high rank things give you, bring you as close as possible that you can get to to being independent. But obviously, there are many collections like this. There's so many collections out there. <laughs> But yeah, just yeah, no, no, you're right. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a valid question. Other questions? Not. We thank Tamar again.